first know that photography was going to play an important role in your life. Thanks so much for having me. Um, yeah, you know, it's funny. I, I have a vision of being super young and seeing myself like this is, I mean, I, I didn't like so young just because you don't really know what you're going to do when you get older. And I had this vision of me directing for some reason. I have no idea where that came from. I was like a kid in Ohio and, but I watched a lot of TV. I, I like, well, I love Sesame street probably because I lived in a suburb and I, I was somehow drawn to the urban aesthetic, I think. And like those trash cans and those brownstone stoops. So somehow I was always drawn right? to that. So yeah. I just was obsessed with Sesame street. And I was, and I was all like, why doesn't my neighborhood look like this? <laughs> and now I live in the city of Los Angeles. Um, so I, I, I it's not so much photography, it's directing and photography. Although if you really want to get into it, there was a, I was in seventh grade and my school had like some Halloween fair and, and my friend's mom was like a fortune teller thing. And she told me, oh, you're like a triple Pisces and you, you, I could see you being, or you're a photographer. Like, so somehow I was told that I was a photographer. <laughs> and so maybe that planted in my head. Uh, and then I, I, I'm a big dreamer. So maybe I went off on that, but uh, you know, it's funny because I, I now that I'm older, I, I think that if you look back in your life and the things that you did when you were like sixth to eighth grade, the things that you obsessed over, that's I think that's an early seed of what will probably make you happy for the rest of your life and what you'll want to do. And I've always been like a collector and I, I was always obsessed with movies and like watching scenes over and over again. You know, I had like a VHS, you know, I, well, I had two VHS machines or we did in the house so I would you know make make dubs of movies so I could watch them over and over and over again and I would I grew up in North County San Diego well I, I was in Ohio till I was 10 then I, then I pretty much grew up in San Diego you'd think oh beautiful weather you'd be at the beach <laughs> but no I was in my bedroom watching movies all day like that's that was what I was obsessed with and then I got into making, you know, videos and film, uh, you know, video production when I was like in, starting in high school and got into editing and, and you know, shooting video. And, uh, and then I really got into photography more seriously when I was in college. I had the opportunity to study abroad in Florence, Italy for a semester, my sophomore year. And I took, I, I took a photography class and I had this incredible teacher who just really inspired me. And not just him, but also just being in Florence, Italy, like everything was just so picturesque and just visually stunning. I mean, you could take a walk down an alley and take a photo of a trash can. It looks like, you know, high art, you know, just <laughs> everything is just so beautiful when you're there. And also I was very inspired, you know, being, you know, away from America and the, for, for the first time, really. And um, I had this great instructor who, uh, funny enough, uh, his name is James White, and he's very successful photographer. He did like the Twilight movies and he does like magazine covers. And I recently reconnected with him. Uh, because he's getting into publishing so we could get to talk, talk oh, about wow. this later because I've, I've had a couple books you know published now and so we've reconnected but um yeah so really it was like college and uh, I just was really obsessed and this is you know film and this is being in a dark room and this is when you know you're on a student budget so you're buying large spools of film and you're rolling roll you're making film rolls yourself you know yeah. so I'm packing as much film as I can because you know if you buy film commercially it's 24 36 you know usually exposures but I would try to jam like 40 or 50 you know <laughs> exposures in and see as much as I can you know, so when you go out you don't you don't have to like replace you know, the roll as much and uh, and then you know, I, I, the he, I don't know if he was allowed to, but he gave me the keys of the dark room. So I would just do these all nighters where you're just totally geeking out over burning and dodging and making the perfect print from your negative and, and, um, and just spending, and then like, you know, you'd come out, you know, this heroic moment as the sun is rising and, you know, you, you, you got the right, you got the right print, <laughs> you the silver gelatin print. And, um, now it's, now it's much different. Now I just spent all this time on my computer, you know, right. with, in Lightroom. <laughs> I love digital. Like I'm not, uh, I'm not complaining at all, but um, yeah, but that was it. It was, it was, it was studying in college and it's interesting now that I'm, uh, I'm curating and I'm exposed to younger photographers. I just, I have a show up right now and we have someone who's a senior in high school who's showing and a lot of younger people are really kind of getting back into dark room into analog and uh, that, that tactile element, you know, because, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's much more precious than you know, everyone has a phone on their cell phone that right. Everyone has, everyone has a camera on their cell phone right now. So the analog process is this unique kind of uh, a novel kind of thing. Isn't but, that so uh, yeah, strange? So, it's great. I think it's yeah. great. I, you know, it's funny because it's like, so I think the visual language of younger people is so different from what it was from 
you know, when I was younger sure. and I think it's great. Yeah. It's just in the way that it's like everybody, everybody speaks English, but not everybody, you know, is a poet or, or speaks yeah. eloquently. Everybody has a camera. Not everybody is a great photographer. Yeah. Uh, I, I think I've been doing it now for decades. So it, it, it's kind of second nature for me, but uh, yeah. Uh, but that's the thing, just because everyone has a camera doesn't mean that everyone is, has the same you know, uh, yeah. aptitude for it. When you, uh, when you went to, you know, when you went to uh, study abroad and you brought your camera with you, I'm always, I'm always interested in that, um, that learning phase, because I feel like lots of new photographers look at photography as like, wow, if I just had a great camera, I'd be able to capture all these great moments. And then they get the camera and then realize that it's a pretty technical thing, you know? Uh, so when you first started in photography, were there any technical struggles that you, uh, that you had to overcome? You know, it's interesting. And, and I read somewhere that like um, obsession over the, the the tools is more of a male thing. Like I heard, I had read that like female photographers aren't as like obsessed with cameras. It's more of like a male thing. And there are people that really get obsessed over the tool and it doesn't necessarily translate to their work being any better. Um, I've never really been much of a, 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 a techie person or, you know, I, I guess for me, I, I, I respect the craft and I learn as much as the craft that I can to, to express what I want to express, what's in my head or, or, or what I want to document. But, um, but really the camera is just a tool. And now you could take great photos again with your cell phone, you know, and, yeah. and you could take great cameras with a plastic a Holga uh, a camera, you know, which you could get for under $50. And um, uh, I think it's really, for me, it's, I've always been gravitated more towards the art, I guess, than the craft. I think you need to have both. And I think the craft, I obviously have a huge respect for the craft, but I think if a, if a, if a, if you look at one print, that's just really, really well crafted, but boring, I'd rather look at something that maybe is uh, kind of a little sloppy, but just really, Packs an emotional punch, in my opinion. Sloppy. I like that. But what about like those early days when, uh, you know, obviously you're shooting on film. Were you shooting point and shoot or were these like full manual cameras? Yeah, no, I had a Nikon. Um, I've always kind of gravitated towards Nikon. It might be the font of the the Nikon logo. <laughs> it might be. Funny. I had a fr I had friends that had Nikon. Yeah. Uh, I when digital when the full frame cameras first came out and I switched from film. I bought a uh, the Canon 5D Mark One and then I realized that I. I think it did not have a flash built in, which mm -hmm. I didn't realize. Uh, so then luckily the Nikon, I think it was the 200 came out. So then I switched to the 200 and then I, uh, and then I got the 700, I think. And now I have the 800, but I'm really bummed that Nikon and a lot of the pro cameras, they, they don't give you built in flash anymore. Mm -hmm. And, and it's as a street photographer, you want the sl smallest thing possible. So I don't want to have this other extra thing that I'm adding on because I can't be sneaky that way <laughs> and not to like put it on and turn it on or you have it on the whole time. I mean, I'm not shooting at a wedding or an event. I don't want to have yeah. this like extra flash on top. Uh, I want to get the D, the Z9 or the 9Z, whatever the new Nikon, but, but they, they're not putting on a built-in flash. And I, I guess maybe I have to live with it. I know the low light capability is much, much better, but um, so I still have my D800. Uh, I think the 850 did not have a flash uh, to my recollection, which was, mm. which would have been the upgrade. So I have the last one, I think that still has a built-in flash. And the reason why I like the built-in flash is not so much at night, but like during the day, I like to shoot like into the sun and I like to have like an extra fill to get like, you know, detail in the face or sure. to really catch eyes, you know, and, or, or like, you know, you're shooting into something that like has some shadow and you want just like a little bit, you know, to play with. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so if Nikon, if you're listening, like Russia, if you're listening, Nikon, if you're listening, just, just throw us a bone, just, I'll pay an extra couple hundred bucks. Just right. give me the option. Just a little, it doesn't have to be great. Just a little fill and flash on the camera. So then I, then I'm one and done. It's so but funny yeah, so I had an Nikon. Oh, sorry. No, I'm sorry. Go on. I get excited. So to finish this, so to finish the, the thought. So I had a Nikon. Uh, it was not a point and shoot. I mean, it was, you know, pretty, it was manual, but it had, uh, you know, it had like a, the meter built in. It wasn't like the really old ones where, uh, where it was completely manual. It had, it, it did have like a program setting, I believe, but it, it's great. It's like when you're starting out driving, it's great to have a stick shift. You know, you want to be able to uh, really understand the machine, you know, so it's good to start manual, understand, you know, aperture, shutter speed, you know, the basics. And then, uh, you know, then, then you could go from there. Were you always very proficient in shooting manual or was there a steep learning curve for you? 
No, no. I mean, the, the, the type of photography that I do, it, it's, I, I don't really have like a lot of time. I'm, I'm like, just, I see something that's happening and I just want to get it right away. So I, I'm, I'm shameless uh, about just keeping it in program mode. I mean, there are people who like think in terms of shutter of aperture all the time and like they'll walk into a room and they'll adjust their camera to whatever the lighting is at the time. <laughs> and I'm, I'm, I don't have that. Uh, I'm not that autistic. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I don't have that. Yeah. I, my mind's on other things. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm, I, I'm shameless. I'm shamelessly, shamelessly shoot in program mode. Um, and then, you know, I'll see if I got it. And then, but one, one thing I do do now is I'll, um, I'm able to control where my exposure is, where in the frame I, I want to set the exposure to. So I'll, I'll do that. Uh, so I'm telling the camera you know, that I want this to be, I want exposed for this part of the frame, you know, so that, that's one thing that I do constantly. I, I have a setting on my camera that I could do that. You know what? Uh, this is kind of off topic, but uh, the Rico, I believe, camera maker, they make a, you know, now that I think about it, I think they only make one camera. Um, the Rico um, GR or something like that. Anyway, The GR3? Uh, I just bought it. Did you I really? just bought the GR3. Yeah, yeah. It, it's it great. has a mode which no other camera that I've ever seen has where it will automatically expose for the brightest thing in the frame which oh. is really interesting so now every photo that you get can be like stylistically very underexposed except for the highlights and i i was really interested in that thinking you know of all the possibilities and immediately thinking of all the photos of i don't know people looking into the sun you know and and being able to see their outline or something anyway i thought that was a very cool tool and you would think that more cameras would would have that but uh i forget where i was going with that but it doesn't matter. no that's it's interesting awesome. because you because then digitally you know because then it's not going to be blown out and then you could always sure. go in and like you know brighten it up yeah but yeah that's interesting yeah. i didn't know that um i know that um you today do um as you said earlier you you, you curate you you look at a lot of photos and i want to i want to talk about your book that i got here california love a visual mixtape and this thing is first of all massive <laughs> uh and second of all um there's a lot of photos that I, I guess i'll let you talk about the book and kind of where it came from but there's a lot of photos in this book and what i want to get to eventually here is how you came up with all the photos in here like what makes one photo better than uh another because it's a, it's a collection of photos from many different photographers so that must have been a huge job so before we get into that tell me Tell me and tell the listeners uh, about the book. Where did the idea come from? Yeah, the uh, California Love of Visual Mixtape is my COVID baby. Um, it came from an exhibit, an annual exhibit that I, I curate at the Hive Gallery and Studios, uh, downtown Los Angeles. I've been doing it. This is my eighth year. I actually have a show up right now. It's 2022. So two years ago in 2020, I changed the theme every year. Uh, we've we did uh, we've done like a fine art theme. We've done street photography. We've done naked versus nude one year. We had uh, analog versus digital, um, and uh, we had alternative alternative process one year. And then for 2020, I'm pretty political. I knew that uh, it was going to be a really contentious election year after four years of the last administration. And California is pretty progressive. It's kind of like a progressive, almost like oasis, you know, in America it seems or one of. And I wanted to do something addressing the election, but. Uh, most of my family voted for Trump, at least in 2016. And I have a lot of, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm pretty, I have a lot of friends. So I have friends on both sides. I, I don't, I don't discriminate, you know, politically. I, I, I'm, I'm, I welcome healthy debate and conversation, but I don't take anything personally, um, which I think is healthy. Um, but I know from talking to people who lean, you know, far right or even far right is that all, facts almost don't even matter anymore. Like you can't, you can't even really, people are going to have their opinion and, I love the show, The Gilded Age, I'm watching right now. And one of the characters perfectly uh, articulated something. Uh, there was a line of dialogue where she casually says, you know, don't let facts get in the way of my opinion. Or I, I don't yeah. let facts get in the way of my opinion. Mm -hmm. uh, which is, I think, really kind of uh, maybe as a, as a way to describe uh, the current political state. So anyways, I wanted to do something addressing politics without being too divisive or political. So I figured the one thing we can't, so we can't really talk about you know, why your side is bad. So, well, one thing we can do is, so I, I painted my, in a way, picture of our progressive, almost utopian version of our inclusive nation state of California. So this is kind of like my progressive view of California in a way. Uh, it's not just photography, but it's a lot of quotes from writers from California or writers talking about California. 
And it's a collection of 110 photographers from all over California. And it really celebrates California. What makes California unique? What makes California what it is? What to, my view of what defines California? And so it started as an exhibit in 2020 in March. Uh, we had an incredible opening and then the and then COVID hit like days later. Uh, so, so, the show, so suddenly it was like, oh man, I was, because you put a lot of work into these shows. You, a lot of people show up to the opening and then it's up for a month and you're hoping people show up and ideally buy work. But um, so that wasn't really happening. So then I, I, I realized I was going to be home for a while. So I switched gears and I like doing books. I, I, I sell prints, but I feel like I could get my work out to much more people if I could put it in, in the form of a book that's accessible and, and could, could get out to a, a fairly wide range of people. So I've always kind of, so I had envisioned it as a book uh, that I was trying to see if I could put together before the exhibit. And luckily I didn't because it, came, it, be, it ended up becoming a much better, much, much bigger, much fuller vision uh, now that I had more time after, after, the, after the exhibit had opened. So yeah, so after, uh, so when COVID hit, I switched gears and I hit the ground running and I reached out to photographers who I knew and I reached out to photographers who I didn't know. And, and I, I put together this, this book, it's 110 photographers, it's over 600 images, it's 320 pages, and it is a really big meal. And, and I wanted to make it a big meal because um, my first book, American Bachelor, is, a, is a, a 120, 130 some pages. And I had a friend who, uh, who said, oh, I saw your book. I went to the bookstore and it was so good. I sat, I went through the whole thing but she didn't buy it. <laughs> so I, I, I'm very aware of that. Like if you're doing a book, it's nice to have a, it's nice to have something that you can't just, just go through in one sitting. Yeah. You need to take it home. You need to spend some time with it. And also I think the more time you spend with it too, it packs a more emotional punch to it. it. It stays with people more. And yeah, I'm very, very proud of it. I'm very proud of it. I worked on it for a while and, and it came out right around the time of the 2020 election and, uh, and we won. <laughs> There you go. I don't want to be divisive. But I don't know. I know you have a wide audience. <laughs> I love, um, I love a lot of things about your book. And I think I told you in an email that I sent to you that it feels at least having grown up in California, that it feels that there's a lot of it that feels very familiar, but also I find what's interesting is that, um, and I was thinking about this, uh, right before we, as photographers tend to photograph the things that we find interesting, or I feel like, uh, photographers love a good juxtaposition, right? We love, um, a good, uh, I don't know, uh, expensive car, you know, and then on the sidewalk is a homeless man or something, you know, that's a very common photo that you could, that you could think of. And when you look through the book, there's a lot of photos that I feel meet that juxtaposition, which is strange because it's like, that's not necessarily like the Calif that's not the everyday California, right? That is, that is something interesting that happened, uh, in that time. So I want to know, like for the book, was there a, um, was there a visual element? Was there a, um, what was it that was tying the entire book together outside of, oh, all these photos just happened in California? Does, does well, yeah, I mean, juxt sense? yeah, juxtaposition. I mean, that's the history of art, right? I mean, like uh, the artists have been, you know, doing this forever, artists, writers. Um, and um, I guess the thing that ties the book together is just my curation. You know, I've been curating for a while. I'm, I'm very picky. Uh, it's hard to, buy gifts for me because I'm very specific <laughs> about what I like. It's hard to shop for me. I hate shopping myself. Um, but uh, yeah. And, and, and when I curate, I'm very, I handpick everything that's in, in the show and people will show up, you know, to the gallery with stuff or they assume that it's just like this, like free for all where anyone, anyone can bring what they want. And, and I don't think that that's the best recipe for a great piece of art. I mean, okay. uh, people don't usually gravitate towards compromised pieces of work, you know, in general. So like I, I, um, yeah, I mean, so I guess that everything's filtered through my taste and that comes from my life experience and me traveling and me going to museums. Like I enjoy going to museums. Um, not everybody does. Like when I, when I go, some, some people like their idea of an ideal vacation is to sit on a beach and drink a beer or a margarita and do nothing at all, which good for them. I mean, like you should do what makes you happy for hundred percent. I like more cultural experiences. So I'm always going to museums. I lived in Paris for, for, for a little while. And I went to museums constantly. I, I'm, I'm always going to galleries. Uh, luckily, I live in Los Angeles, which is possibly the cultural capital of the world. I mean, I go to museum, go to museums and gallery shows all the time. That's I'm always constantly looking at stuff. Uh, I get daily email blasts from like, uh, like Lens Scratch, Your Photo Daily, um, The Eye of Photography. I'm always looking. I'm always discovering new work. I'm, 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 I'm always looking at stuff. So that's, you know, that hones my filter and then the book is a compilation of my years of experience and things that I've seen and things that I gravitate towards and things that I love 
and eliminating things that I don't like or things that maybe um, are too repetitive. Like, you know, sometimes I'll, I'll pass on something. It's not because I don't like it because I already have this other thing that's very similar and I don't want to put two things that are, that are too similar. So there is an art to creation. And, and I, I recommend, uh, I think curation and, and curation and photo editing are so important for a, photo for a photographer, not, not just going out and creating the work, but really uh, honing and sharpening your eye and your, and your taste is extremely important. So yeah, curation has absolutely defined who I am as a photographer, I'd have to say. Mm -hmm. So you said that there's 110 photographers in this book, right? Yeah. I want to know how did the um, how did the process start? Did you just reach out to these photographers and say, hey, can you send me four or five photos? Or did you say, hey, send me all of your photos. I want to pick out your best ones to put in into this book. I'm I'm pretty good about going through and I'm pretty quick. So I, I could fly through a lot of images pretty quickly. So um uh, I had people, you know, I want to, I wanted everyone to be happy. So it's kind of a negotiation. Like I want the photographer to show what they want to show, but at the same time, I want to, I'm looking at the whole book. Like th they're not looking at 320 pages. They're looking at just their, you know, the, the, sure. what's, what's in there. So they're just seeing like a small piece of it. So, um, yeah, I mean, with some photographers, it's a negotiation and it's a, some, it's more, more than others. And some are just very open to, yeah, whatever you want to put in, you know, you know, go ahead. Um, most people, whatever they're putting up publicly on the web on on the internet they're going to be happy with already or they wouldn't post it so it's already kind of pre-filtered and pre-approved on, on some level so i'm really looking at that or they're sending me stuff and ideally they're not sending me stuff this is a good lesson for photographers because you could really tell some uh and it, and it doesn't even really matter if you're a beginner or or even more advanced some people are really good about about deliberately sending images uh to me, like a, like a concise file of, of images that are ready to go. And some will send me so many images. And it's like, why are you sending me four photos of the exact same thing? I mean, that, that just yeah. shows that it's almost amateurish. And it's and these are not amateur photographers. You know? So again, photo editing, you have to spend the time photo editing. You have to be able to look and, and working as a commercial photographer does help with this. Like if, you, if you're shooting headshots, I've done headshots for years. And when you're shooting, you know, if you shoot like four rolls of someone and they all look fair, if you have like two rolls of the same setup, you have to be able to pick which is the best one. And yeah, there are five that are great, but narrow down the five, like pick one. Like, and it's, and, and maybe it's not, and it's not perfect. It's completely subjective, but that's a choice. You have to start making those choices and that's going to help you define your work. And so when you have like three shots of like, you know, a car or a bird, like you have to pick what's the best photo that, 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 that that's the, it's a challenge and it's not easy, but you got to do it. Yeah. So, yeah, so it's tricky. So some photographers, uh, it was easier to, to narrow down than others, but at the end of the day, again, it was like, um, uh, everything in the book I'm happy with. So this was just so that I'm, uh, I'm clear here. You would, you would ask photographers for some of their work and then would they choose the photos that would go in the book or they would send you photos and then you would ultimately choose the ones that go in the book? Yeah. I just realized I didn't ask you answer your question. <laughs> um, so I, it was kind of a little bit of both. Like I would, I would first tell them what I was doing with the book and people are a little suspicious or, Oh, you know, well, you know, what are you going to do with my images? Whatever. So I had to, I thought I, if, if they knew me, they saw what I did and they've seen my book, then they were, they were cool with it. But I, I was also reaching out to people who I didn't know and didn't know me. So I had to like tell them who I was and kind of sell them on the, on the project. And um, usually I, I'm not going to approach someone unless I know specifically which images are theirs that I already want to include. So it was mostly me saying, I would like to, I would like to include these images. And then I'm, and then, let's talk about any other images that you might want to include. Mm -hmm. So it usually started out that way. It was, um, and then once LACP came on, which is the Los Angeles Center of Photography, which everyone listening should consider joining. Uh, they have incredible classes, been around forever, uh, f founded by Julia Dean, an amazing photographer and, and educator. And um, all proceeds for the California book go to the Los Angeles Center of Photography. Um, once they came on, then we did a call for submissions through LACP. So then people submitted and I selected. But again, it was me selecting. And then once I selected, then it was a conversation with the photographer to open it up to include possible other submissions that they wanted to, to, to submit. So is it safe to say that you saw tens of thousands of images in the curation of your book here? Possibly. Yeah, okay. possibly. So, I didn't keep count, but yeah. <laughs> did, did you did you say how many photos are in the book? Over 600. So how do you make the decision for which photo stands out over the rest? How do you get from 10,000 to 600? Is there an example maybe of, of photos that, that you liked, but again, just didn't fit the book or, or, 
or something of that nature? Yeah, uh, you know, it's it's funny because like th there are professional photographers who had great images, but they were sh they were created a few years ago and may have got maybe the original got lost in a hard drive that crashed, or they can't find the negative, and they just have like maybe they just have an image that had a watermark on it. So that, that there was I was surprised that there was a, a decent amount of those images, which is wow. you know, which happens you know in life, and. Um, yeah, you know, it just really comes down to the curatorial process. You know, I've uh, having been making images for decades, uh, editing and then curating, I'm pretty clear about what I like. And um, sorry, what's the question again? I know we're talking about <laughs> how did I refine? How did I get down to the how did I make selections? Yeah, I guess I, I you just know what you like, you know? Yeah, I, you know what you like. Okay, so but maybe it's not for everybody too. I mean, there, there are other skills that I don't have that other people do. This is no, just no, something no, no, that I've, no. I've done. No, I, I get that. I get that. I get the, you know, you know what you like. And I think that after, um, you know, shooting professionally for 10 plus years, like I understand that sometimes there's something about a photo. You don't know what it is. You just like it and you're going to choose that one and, and you're going to move on. But I know that a lot of people just getting started, uh, oftentimes one of the most asked questions in the beginner photography podcast, Facebook community is like, which one is better, A or B, you know, and, and I'm trying to, I guess, give yeah. some, uh, uh, some, some, some solid information that people can get to on how they can make the decision on their own through how do you make decisions on your own to, for the photos? that, that we're I think doing. it's a great question. I think it starts with, well, uh, if you happen to be watching this on YouTube, this is my, uh, this is part of my, this is part of my photo book collection. Oh my. I'm obsessed. It used to be vinyl and I started selling off my vinyl. It used to be a wall of vinyl. So I, uh, now it's, I'm obsessed. I buy like so many. And then I have a bunch over here that I'm still going through that I just, just got. So, and I'm going to libraries. I'm going to bookstores constantly. If you're in Los Angeles, please visit Arcana uh, store. It's a bookstore of the arts. Visit Hennessy and Ingalls downtown. Uh, incredible book soup has a really great uh, curation of photo books. Uh, obviously Strand in New York, there's their so many great bookstores or so many great there are great library collections where you could find out of print books i'm constantly looking at stuff so that is going to help you make uh, make choices and um yeah you just got to keep like looking at stuff i think that's how you sharpen your eye and just taking note of what it is that you don't like versus what it is that you don't like yeah and i think and the talking uh, being around smart people with good taste helps and you're having conversations about things and you're debating and you're de defending what you like and you're hearing someone else defend what they like and maybe you know you're you're forming your opinions based on not only what you see but you know you're getting information from other people yeah i think it's a lifelong process and 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 and, it, and things evolve too and things change like i'll i'll be selling but like i'll buy a book and i'm really into it and then maybe 10 years later i'm thinking oh you know i'm i'm kind of not so into this now like maybe maybe i've moved on mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And this is kind of uh I guess a side question, this isn't necessarily about the photography, but when it comes to the book, it's full of photos. You said over 600 photos. Can I ask why the cover is, um, is, uh, is, is illustrated art? So yeah, I wanted the cover to be something where, cause I, again, I go to bookstores a lot. I go to libraries. I look at a lot of books. I buy a lot of books and I wanted, I wanted the cover to just really jump out at you to where you go, look at this and you go, what the hell is this thing? I need to check this out. Like, so there's something about this cover to me that, and I worked with the designer a lot. He was funny enough. He's from California, but he was in Hawaii at the time. So this kind of has like a, definitely has like a beach, you know, it's, it's on the it's water and everything. Yeah. So Hawaii may have, may have helped the visual, the, 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 the bright colors, but um, yeah, I just wanted to have a cover that really jumps out at you where it just draw just draws you in. Uh, my first book American Bachelor has a photo on the cover um my my second book Folsom Street is an illustration my the, my fourth book this casino book I'm working on is probably going to be an illustration that I'm working on right now um you know it's it's I think for a cover you just in my opinion you just want to have something that just really grabs your attention that really gets you thinking there are a lot of photographers who really want to go for a traditional like linen you know, with just text. And I, and I totally respect that. I have a lot of books that are like that myself. Um, it's just a, yeah, it's just, it's just a personal, personal taste, mm -hmm. but I it like does grab it. your attention. It does. It really does. And that like the first thing that I thought of, I was like, this photo screams California, <laughs> you know, with the palm <laughs> Thank trees you. and the beach and the taco on front. Um, Thank you. I, I will say looking through the book though, I was hoping that there would be more photos of tacos, but um, <laughs> That's fine. It's there are, fine. There, there, it's are the cover. <laughs> there are tacos represented, and there's there a great Jonathan Gold quote about tacos uh, 
as well. Actually, there are two mentions of tacos, at least two mentions of tacos. S still about all, ta all tacos matter. Short. Yeah, all tacos. <laughs> I love tacos. Um, that's too funny. I like that perspective, though, because that's really interesting. I feel like you're thinking of your book. Obviously, hold on. What am I trying to say here? So when it comes to putting together a book, there's something that, that you're trying to say. You know, this is your visual mixtape of California. This is what California represents to you. But there's still obviously a business aspect of it for you to think about and stress over the front of this book in the hopes that it's going to obviously sell more. So when it comes to creating books, again, this is a world that's pretty foreign to me. Were there any decisions that you had to make about the book strictly in the hopes that it sells over your own uh, artistic desires? Uh, I mean, luckily, I think my tastes are fairly commercial board like not not uncommercial i guess if that's a word um going back to the cover though uh, another factor is there's 110 photographers so if i had uh, one image then one I'd, image. Have to, I'd have to pick one photographer so it was much easier to, <laughs> to avoid that uh with with an illustration um so that was that was also a factor in um yeah no i i think in general you you have to be aware of an audience you know if you're if you're making a book and you want it to sell at a bookstore someone is going to have to want the book to be sold at that store so it's going to have to they're going to have to pick it uh if you end up lucky enough to be to afford a publicist they're gonna to have to figure out some way to market it and sell it you, so you have to kind of think about marketing what's what's interesting about this why would someone want to buy it and books are expensive uh if you're a novelist or a poet you could or if you're a writer period you could create books on demand. Uh, you could just have the file existing on the cloud and then as someone buys the book, it could be printed and sent directly to them through Amazon or, or, or publishing services. There are companies that do that. Not so, You can do that with Blur, but the expense is so much higher and you don't have quality control. Like I want to I want to be able to look at the, just, a, uh, just a, with the same with a print. I mean, you could get prints sold where it'll go directly from a third party to your, to the to the customer, but I would want to be able to look at it. Plus, you know, you want to sign it. I would want to sign print if I'm buying a print. So for photographers, it's a little tricky for artists, you know. So um, yeah, the the expense of making the books, they're heavy. The expense of moving them around, the expense of distribution, uh, it's 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 not cheap. So you have to. In California, a lot of retails for fifty dollars, which is a pretty good value considering other fine art photography books. But you know, a lot of people that that's a big expense for a lot of people. Sure. So you, you do have to think in terms of. Uh, uh, it being commercial enough, it being you know desirable to a wide enough audience to justify the cost and 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 just to get it to a wider, just to get it into people's hands. Yeah. Now, with all the time that you've been making books, as you said, you're on your fourth book now. Uh, how deep does the vision go before the book is created? We as photographers are taught, you know, like what makes you stand out is 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 the pre visualization process, right? The more that you can visualize the photo in your head before you take it the better it's going to be. So is it the same with the book? Like, are you thinking in terms of hard and soft cover, paper types, number of pages, amount of text? Like, are all these things planned out before you, like, really started putting the book together? Or was it done, um, was it more of an organic process? Uh, the, the designer that I worked with on my first uh, book, his name is Damon Robinson. He's just brilliant. He was in, uh, he worked in, um, I think it was called industrial design. So he worked with like packaging uh, and stuff for a while. He's, he's an illustrator, designer. And we spent a lot of time figuring out how the look and the design of, of the first book. And it was a lot of what, what I wanted based on my photo collection and, and books that I, you know, I, 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 at the time I went to a ton of bookstores and I, I, uh, I've really, I found this one book by Lee Freelander called Cottage. Mm. That's, um, I don't think it's that popular. I haven't really seen it around too much, but but I, the, the the shape of it was perfect. It just fits so perfectly ergonomically in my hand. So I copied that exact size. And I like square format for me because I, I tend to shoot both uh, landscape and horizontal orientation. So with a square book, you could fit both in uh, fairly, uh, you know, e easily. Uh, and, and you could kind of play with grid patterns and stuff. So you could have more than one image on a, on a page and it just works out really well for me. So I figured out a design with America Bachelor and I just copied that. So, uh, so, so I would recommend just, you don't have to reinvent the reel every time, find something that works for you. Uh, and, uh, and once I figured out that, then I'm, I'm pretty much using the same template and in InDesign for my future books. Cause it's something that I already, I already kind of did all the, did all the, the work myself with figuring out what's perfect for me. Yeah. And again, that's in my voice that has to do with all the stuff that I've seen and 
you know, what I like. Not everybody likes square. Some people, you know, if you, if you know that you're shooting more more landscape or more portrait, if you're doing all portraits, then it might make not it might not make sense to have a square book. You know, you'd want more of a portrait orientation. So these are all choices that that, that are very very subjective and very specific, you know, to to the individual. I think that you just like breezed over something that was really important there. That was, you know, in photography, we have to create our own visual style and we have to shoot the things that we love in the way that we love them. Um, but you're taking that to another level. Like I also love books and I want to create books in this style that I love and the way that I like to enjoy them. And then you're merging them together, which has to just be a really, really fulfilling process to see photos that you love in a format that you love as well. That was, that was very cool. Oh um, man, I'll tell you, like, I don't have kids. Uh, and, but when my first book came out, uh, and, and then he, he, seeing the book do well outside of me, and then I had a book signing and people were showing up who weren't friends of mine, but just, they knew the book and they wanted yeah. to, they wanted to be part of it. It's, I feel like I got the pride of when you're, when you have a kid and your kid does something like, I felt like I had that pride and these are my babies. I have three babies. I've heard other photographers talk about that. You know, these yeah. are, these are my babies. I have three babies and I have a fourth on the way. <laughs> I love that. That's such a great way to, uh, to think about it. You know, there is, there's gotta be that deep personal connection there. Um, yeah. It's our creation. Right. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you, you said something earlier about, uh, uh, about curating. You said that you're working with or that you've seen photos from even just like a senior in high school, right? And um, I think it can be difficult. I know who I was as a senior in high school and it was not any sort of, uh, you know, I wasn't able to create any sort of visual um, uh, um, story, I suppose, out of my head with a camera. But I want to know from somebody who's seen a lot of images like yourself, when do you think a photographer goes from somebody who's just taking snapshots to um, an artist? That's a great question. And it's a very, very important question. And the answer is, again, it's completely subjective. Some people uh, from early on, you know, have, have a really strong voice. And I mean, I think that goes back to, I mean, think of like junior high, there's some kids who are just so funny and just have, have, are so idiosyncratic, you know? And then there are people who maybe develop their voice like a little bit later. And, and that's, and who knows where that comes from, but, but photography is interesting. And, and Chuck Close, the artist talks about um, photography being the, e one of the, I can't, I'm paraphrasing and I'm sure I'm going to uh, chop it up, but he talks about photography being the easiest art to pick up, but the hardest to develop a voice in probably, probably, especially now, because it's so ubiquitous. It's so everywhere. You know, everyone has a camera in their pocket. Uh, so to actually have a voice in photography, you know, now is, 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 I think, I think, I think that's really the trick. And, and I don't know what my voice is. I think my voice has to do with uh, emotion has to do with finding, uh, um, packing some sort of like an emotional punch. Oh, oh I, I was very complimented because I, I, in this exhibit that I have up now at the Hive Gallery, I had multiple people come up and they said, oh, I knew exactly which pieces were yours, which I, which is a huge compliment, you know, because I, it's salon style and it's all, it's not all clustered together, but to have, have, um, to get, I think to get to that point is the, uh, I think is the goal as a photographer to be able to have someone say, oh, I, I, I know that that's yours. I know that that's your piece. Uh, now with post-production, with Lightroom and Photoshop, you could, you could do a lot of stuff in post. You could have a certain style. Um, uh, but sometimes that's just kind of putting a style over, over your image. So I think, I think you could tell when it's something that's more organically created. Uh, and the voice comes from a deeper place than, than just like, you know, like a, just like something that's covering it. But, uh, but that is the goal. I think that is the goal. And the answer is keep doing it. You just got to keep doing it, pick up the camera, go out as much as you can, create, capture, shoot, uh, create as much as you can, edit as much as you can. All, uh, all the work that you do uh, culminates into finding your voice. That's perfect. Can you think of a, a photographer who, you would consider has a really strong photographic voice? Yeah, I mean, it's uh, I, I, there are a lot and it's fun, like there's a name that is in my head right now, but I'm sure there's a there are many, many others and I'm sure friends are probably gonna say, oh, why don't you mention me? <laughs> um, there's a woman named Wendy Schneider who I've never met and uh, she's, I think she's out of Colorado and her work is so idiosyncratic. It almost looks like uh, there's a real painterly element to it, but whenever I see her work, I know exactly, I, I know, I know exactly that it's hers. And, um, there are many, many others. Uh, I'm, I'm not, it's, 
but I, I'm sure I'll think of a bunch. And I don't know if 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 I I'll probably I could send you a list of follow up lists. But no, 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 off no. the top I, of my head, there was a follow up question to that, which mm -hmm. is, um, sorry, there's one more that came to um, yes, uh, 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 Ryan uh, Ryan Shooty, who's in the book. He does these amazing. They're almost like uh, Jeff Wall type. Yes. Very large kind of tableaus. Uh, of, let me. Uh, there was of, one. Um, a lot of characters, and they're 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 definitely they're they're staged. Um, there's uh, George Byrne is out of L.A., uh, whose work is copied a lot, but he was the first person that I've I've seen him doing very very illustrative kind of style. Uh, flipping through the book now because I'm sure there I'm sure there are a lot in the book. It's funny I actually had it opened to Ryan's page uh, right before this interview, and I closed it to bring the book over here, and I wish uh, that I didn't because. Uh, as you said, I mean, th there's there's a lot there. Obviously, the characters. I was drawn to the uh, uh, to the landscape photos that he had had. Just the just the light that was being used was absolutely phenomenal there. Um, but I guess the follow up question that I want his work's to incredible, and he has a book. I highly recommend getting his book. It's 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 great. Do you know the title of it offhand? Uh, I think it's just I think it's just his monograph with his name. Boom. Look at that. Wow. <laughs> that is gorgeous. Okay. Great. I'm definitely going to have to look that up. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, you should have him, uh, you should have him on your show. He might, he might send you a free copy. <laughs> you know him personally? Uh, yeah. He's great. Okay. Well, I'm going to have to, uh, I'm going to have to use your name. I'll connect you. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I'll connect you. He's great. Thank you. Um, the question that I wanted to know was when you look at photographers with a, a clear photographic, um, I'm sorry, a uh, visual storytelling ability, right? Like you look at their work and you know that it's theirs. Um, what are those elements? Like, okay, hold on. Sorry. Th that was, that was way too vague of a question. <laughs> that was yeah. Way how long do we vague. have here? <laughs> yeah. um, let's take Ryan, for example, right? Ryan's work doesn't look like your work. It doesn't look like uh, Wendy's work. Is it, is it simply finding one thing and just going really deep into that, whether it be, I don't know, composition, light, you know, whatever, the, the characters that you use, or is it uh, more questioning yourself and the decisions that you're making uh, in order to, to create the photos that you want? I don't know if that was a good question or not, but I'm yeah, going to see mean, if there's anything that you have to say I about mean, that. I feel like we're kind of getting into like a philosophical, almost like existential concept of like, where do you get your voice? What, what makes you do the things that you do? Mm -hmm. And I think it, it all comes down to, uh, yeah. Like uh, who, who are you as a person? Like, uh, do you have like an, ex oh, an examined life? Are you always questioning things? Are you, um, you know, what, what relationships have you been in? Like what, 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 and, and how have those relationships in your life affected you? Uh, I think your work is a result of every book you've read, every, you know, every like great love you've had, every, every um, adventure that you've had, every, every exotic place you've traveled, uh, every great film that inspired you, you know, or piece of art that you've seen that you, that just stops you and arrests you in your tracks and just makes you look at it and silences your mind. You know, the silence is the chatter in your mind. And, and I think all that stuff cul culminates over years and over time to hone your voice if you're paying attention and if you're if you're working it out too, and picking up the camera and 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 making art and editing your work, you know, narrow, honing it down, making those those hard choices, and it's not easy, um, but luckily there there's no uh, punishment for making the wrong choice. You just kind of keep going. Uh, there's no harm. So you just gotta you just gotta keep keep sharpening who you are as a person. And this is what artists do that makes us different from, I think, the average, you know, the average person, you know, is that we're always asking questions or we're always looking stuff and we're, you know, we're, we're more sensitive, you know, we tend to be more sensitive to things and, and we're, we're catching things, we're seeing things. And for me, I'm more of a documentary artist, you know, where I'm, I'm documenting what I see as opposed to having something in my head that I want to you know, create. And, and they're like, there are two kinds of, two kinds of sculptures. There's sculptors, there's a, there's additive and subtractive and someone will, will take a, take a, 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 just a lump of clay and build something fr from that. And some will take marble and reduce it down, you know, to something that, uh, something. And I've heard of filmmaking being compared to that, you know, where I have like documentary, you know, you, you're, you're taking a bunch of elements and you're reducing it down to something as opposed to someone who's just a real visionary filmmaker, who's just building something, you know, just creating something from, from, from nothing or from, you know, so something that's a preconceived notion that's in their head. So 
yeah, so that, that's something to consider too. Like, are you someone who is going to go out and, and just hit the streets and find things and then create art from that? Or do you have things in your head that you want to just create that you could do in your home, you know, by, by, you know, building things and documenting, shooting them still live, you know, creating still life pieces. Um, there's kind of two different ways of approaching photography from that way too. Do you think that you can properly look at both sides of that spectrum and appreciate it equally as being somebody oh, yeah. who doesn't go out and create large images? Do you think that um, looking at those has more weight to you or, or less weight to you? Yeah, no, no. I, I value everything. I, for me, at the end of the day, does, does it does, does it give me an emotional impact? Is it an impactful image? And and I think that's important for me. It is because a lot of people, like in academia and a lot of people in the museum uh, world, not everybody, but 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 there is kind of a tendency to almost over intellectualize something where you justify liking something. Mm -hmm. And I'll look at I'll look at a lot of pieces, and it just does nothing for me. And and even like the people that I'm with, but maybe there's some reason why it's there or reason why it should be celebrated, that that you need to like learn about it before you can appreciate it. But I tend to not be gravitated towards that kind of work, and and not to devalue it because obviously a lot of a lot of that's very successful. But just in my opinion, and everyone's entitled to their opinion, uh, I gravitate towards stuff that just affects me, you know, that hits me like on a gut level. And for example, Ryan's work uh, is, is very much created, you know, from nothing. And it's very much fabricated in a way and it's brilliant and I love it. And it's in the book. <laughs> I just, yeah. and I, and it's been in a couple of my shows and he's great. And I, I wish I could afford uh, his work. It's, <laughs> it's, he does these large pieces that are, that are definitely worth it, but um, yeah, they're, they're a little more expensive. Yeah. They stand out for sure. <sighs> oh. I, I feel like, um, you know, I feel like you kind of, I don't want to say that you shied away from like, oh, well, this is turning like kind of philosophical and how do we answer these questions? Um, but for me, I really feel like those questions are really important, uh, or I guess, I'm sorry, not those questions, but those answers here are really important for photographers to hear that like, it's okay just to like whatever it is that you like, you know, absolutely, you like it, you absolutely. Like it for a reason. Um, and I think that that's going to give a lot of people hope. So if... We... Every photographer who you look up to, every artist started somewhere. Mm -hmm. Everyone picked up a paintbrush, picked up a pen, you know, picked up a camera somewhere and just started making images and just started doing it. Everyone. So everyone should absolutely be like, there's no reason not to do it. Everyone, if, if you want to do it, you should do it. Uh, I also will see, and maybe this is a social media thing. Uh, of people will post and and the, social media is weird. That's a whole other kind of seg segue into maybe right. a different conversation. Because um, I was going to ask you about uh, in, we, should, we should talk about Instagram because I was going to ask you because you have much more experience uh, talking to other photographers about this. But but there is social media burnout, and then I'll see people that'll occasionally have these posts of God, what do you do when you just get burnt out? You know, I, I you know I just pick up my camera and I go out. And I'm not getting it. Don't do it. <laughs> if it's not making you happy, don't do it. Do it. Do it when it makes you happy. Go do something else. Go read a book. Go take a trip somewhere. You know, or or get some work done that you need to do. Go go through all your bills or whatever. You know, do <laughs> do some busy work. And then when you really and then when you really want to do it, then you go do it. <laughs> like no one's no one's forcing you to do it. Yeah. There's this. I see these weird conversation or debates, and maybe it's just to get some social media pl uh, play. But um, yeah, so so absolutely, everybody should be inspired. But the flip side of that is. It, it should be fun. It should be something that you want to do. It should be something that you're gravitated towards. No one's making you do it. I, I have a, I have a, I don't want to say that it's an opposite take on that, but I am very much, um, I would say it's more of like, I'm a creature of habit, right? Like if I, so, uh, in 2017 and in 2018, I did this thing. It was, uh, it was this app called one second a day, right? You just take a picture or a video with your phone and then you upload it to this app and then it, at the end of the year, you have, you know, 365 second long video of your entire year. 2017, it went great. 2018, it went great. And then I skipped like two days and I haven't done it since, you know? Um, and I think for me, there was, there was a lot of days where I didn't want to do it, but like I almost had to force myself to do it because if I didn't, I know that I would stop doing it completely. And I love that idea of like, oh no, if, if you want to do something, like just go out and do it. And if you're not feeling inspired, like don't do it. But I personally feel like I would just never get anything done if that was the case. Does that make sense? 
Well, you're specifically talking about a long-term project that involves specifically doing something every day. Okay, so that, that's yes. a very specific example. And in that, okay, so then then in a year when it's done, you'll probably get the, you will be happy for having done it. So that 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 is a happiness that you'll get from it. That is a gratification you'll get from it. So it, that's a deferred gratification. Um, but then another question is 10 years from now, if we look at your body of work and we look at this this video that you created that one year that was maybe uh, uh, maybe more of a struggle to 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 execute is that going to be one of your top 10 pieces of your of the last decade or you know like so that's going to be the ultimate question so we're making things for 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 we're making we're just kind of constantly i don't know for me i'm just constantly building this body of work and and i'll think about it later but at, <laughs> but you got to have fun along the way you do got to have fun along the way. That's, that's very true. Um, well, which is not to say, I mean, which is not to say I, I welcome the struggle, you know, obviously not everything's, you know, fun and games, uh, photo editing is not always fun. Like, you know, going through and like dumping images and, and, you know, doing, doing gig work, which is, it took me a while to figure this out, which is different from fine artwork. You know, there's fine art photography and then there's, you know, the stuff you do to pay the bills. Uh, I didn't realize this until I was a professional photographer for a little while that wedding photographers make more than fashion photographers. Uh, wedding photographers do very well. Uh, it's, you're not gonna see a lot of wedding photographers in art galleries. And I was told if you're a, uh, if you're a wedding photographer, you should kind of hide that from gallerists or, or people who, who are buying your work in a way because it kind of devalues the fine art, you know, mystique of being an artist. Um, what? So I'd heard this. I've heard, I'm not a gal. I, I, I curate at this one sure. show, but this is I've been told this by by galleries. That's so interesting to think of. Um, it's like there uh, is there is a separation of of commercial and fine art. Yeah, and got to pay the bills somehow, right? So, but I think you need to have a separate website almost as the as a commercial photographer and then as a fine art photographer. How how would you define fine art photography? Uh, fine art photography is um, something that someone would want to buy and put on their wall. Something that they would, uh, something that maybe tells a story. I'm, I, I'm sure that I'm sure there's a definition somewhere that's much more succinct. This is just off the top of my head. Yeah. Uh, commercial photography is someone paying you to do something. Fine art photography is the end result of a passion. It's it's an it's an art. It's something that can be decorative. Do you think that? Uh, oftentimes I've seen like street photographers go out and just like, you know, it's just a point and shoot. They just go out and then they just, you know, essentially it's a, it's a, a disposable camera, you know, they'll go out and they'll create these like amazing looking photos, but it almost seems as like there's not much intent behind the photo. They just went out and just started snapping away. Um, do you think that that is that that style of just going out with very little control over your camera? Uh, do you think that those photos could still potentially be considered fine art? Oh, hundred percent. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cartier-Bresson considered himself an amateur. I mean, he shot with, I mean, I think it had more control, but it was very, very small, uh, almost basic like a point camera. shoot, mm -hmm. uh, very, very basic camera. And he's to me, one of my, he's my favorite photographer. So um, yeah, I mean, but again, going back, the, the tool is not, uh, it doesn't make the, uh, the, the, the tool is not the important part. Like when you go to a gallery, you know, I'm not always thinking, Oh, what camera was this? It's like, you're just looking at the, the final product. Of course. Of course. Sometimes you're thinking about the camera. <laughs> depends, on, <laughs> depends on the piece, but you know what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I guess I was just trying to figure out, um, you know, I mean, again, I think something that I struggle with personally is is that intent, right? Because I, like you, am not somebody who can um, create something out of nothing. I feel like I work best by going out, seeing something, and then, oh, I'm going to get that. I'm going to capture that. I'm going to use the skills that you've learned as a photographer, composition, lighting, you know, and then capture the best photo of that thing in that moment. And then that's the shot. And being able to create something is really hard for me. So I feel like visualization in that aspect, I want to, maybe I'm just trying to, um, um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for here? But, uh, you know, tell myself that like, it's okay that the photos that you create that aren't these grand masterpieces that aren't these uh you know huge put together pieces can still be uh worth something in the art world can still mean something oh abs yeah absolutely yeah absolutely mm -hmm. um i mean I, I i could show you a ton of examples of uh of brilliant photographers uh, uh shooting stuff that was absolutely absolutely spontaneous i mean uh, the uh, robert franks the americans i mean it was him cruising around america on a road trip and none of that was was contrived none of that i mean there was all stuff that he just kind of shot along the way you know and and uh, yeah, I mean, 
history's history's full of that. Yeah. But um, yeah, I think we keep getting back to, yeah. I mean, in, so in terms of intent, I mean, the, so that might be a defining factor between like documentary and street photography, where you have an intent and you're shooting like a larger, there's a larger topic or a, a, maybe a, a subject matter or a theme that you're doing over time, that it becomes a documentary project. Uh, street photography is just, you just, I could take my camera right now. I live like a block from Wilshire Boulevard. I could go down and there are people right there. I could go start start you know making photography. New York is great for that. You know, big mm-hmm. cities. You know, you have like people I, people right there. LA is more of a car culture, so I'm shooting a lot for my car, which is nice to have like a longer mm-hmm. lens, uh, which is great because you could kind of get in and out. And, uh, but um, but yeah, n- um, uh, but again, it just get, it, it gets down to doing it. For me, it's documentary. For other people, it might be you know creating something or having like this vision of, of, of what they want to document. I, I think if you have kids, you know, most people gravitate towards you know shooting photos of the kids. So think of different ways you know you could do that. And you have like a you basically have a free model. <laughs> they may they may not not be uh, receptive to taking direction. But yeah, exactly. <laughs> they may not, they may not take direction very well, but. Uh, but yeah, think of creative ways you could shoot your kids wherever you are. I mean, you, if you have a cell phone on you, you could always be be documenting and it's digital. You could throw it away. You don't have to pay for the film. You don't have to pay for the processing. You can just delete it at the end of the day uh, or not or keep it and then look at it in a few years. It's you're probably going to like it. It's going to it's going to have more value. It, 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 luckily, photography ages very well. Yes. You can, you can take a photo of something mediocre. It'll look way better 50 years from now. It'll look <laughs> great because it'll be this this time piece, you know, uh, isn't that funny? Isn't that so funny? I love photography. Photography is weird and photography is great for sure. Um, but, but since we're talking about, I did mention social, social media mm-hmm. and I did want to ask you, um, cause I think a lot of people are chasing stuff for like likes. And, and that is something that I, I'm, I'm, I, I haven't done and I try to avoid. Um, what's, what's up with people buying, uh, buying uh, likes and buying like, uh, um, uh, I guess followers. Uh, is this something that a lot of people are doing? Because I see a lot of photographers that have like tens of thousands of followers and their work is, doesn't really seem to merit that. But, but who That's am I to say? Question. Yeah, no, I, uh, I, short answer is I don't know. <laughs> I feel like I would yeah. personally never do that. You know, the idea of buying likes and followers is just um, like, it doesn't help anything. Like, I, I okay, I take that back. I kind of get the, the idea behind it of like, if you have a large following, uh, it looks really impressive, right? And yeah. maybe suddenly you feel if you were looking at somebody with a huge social following and you felt like these photos aren't that great, but they have such a huge following, maybe I'm missing something. And then exactly. you go deeper into that. I don't know. But again, I'm not I've never done it. I don't I don't understand it. I don't even know if I I, well, I was going to say, I don't know if I've known anybody who's done it, but I th- feel like the people who would do it just wouldn't admit to it. So no one would admit to it. No one would admit to it. But I think we should start calling people out because I think it's total BS. <laughs> it's this, it's the, we got to call it the emperor's uh, new clothes. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Starting well, today, starting here and now. <laughs> yeah, we're calling everybody out. Everybody we're, we're who doing buys it. followers, you're no longer welcome here. Yeah, no, it's strange. It's just, you know, people just want to be accepted for, uh, the things that they like, you know, I mean, we did this in, in elementary school. I liked, um, uh, I liked the, the blue Pokemon, you know, whatever it is, but other kids liked the red Pokemon. And I tried to convince them that mine was better. And, um, I, I found friends who also liked the blue Pokemon simply because they like the blue Pokemon, you know, whatever it is, you know, we're going to gravitate towards people who like the same things that we like. And, and if it looks like a hundred million people like what we have to offer, hopefully we, it just got to come from insecurity that's gotta be it, you know, not knowing who you are as a photographer. Yeah. Um, and fragile like egos where, you know, people think very highly of themselves. Speaking of it's crazy. So not to call not to name a name. Cause I don't even know their name. So I just had an opening uh-huh. on uh, two Saturdays ago. It was great. It was so great. Cause like we're getting out of COVID now and just d- days after my last big opening in 2020 COVID started and just days before this most recent opening, the city, the county of LA or the city of LA just started to loosen up the mask mandate. So people were just so ready to go out and we had a great showing and I sold some of my pieces, which is great. And, um, and uh, so you could go on Instagram and you could geotag or you could just find the geotag of the gallery. So I'm, I'm just looking, I'm just trying to get images because I, I was so busy catching up with people. I didn't really get a chance to take too many photos. I was hoping to get some images of the, the gallery being full of people. And, and this one guy posts a video of him walking into the gallery saying that he's that he's there for to be interviewed for some podcast, like he's some big shot, and it was like his show. And, and I'm the curator. This guy was wow. completely bullish. 
full of crap. Wow. So anyways, th th these people are out of their minds. So th these, these egos on social media, I mean, I don't know, reality TV, I think is, has really made an imprint on politics and, and society. So we should not be feeding, uh, feeding narcissists any more than they need to be <laughs> at this point. Oh, that's so sad to hear. That's a, that's almost as sad as um, I had seen an article where they said that um, teenagers increasingly were buying products from like the store or whatever, and then posting them on social media, claiming that they were sponsored by those products. Yeah, it's completely unnecessary. I mean, I, <laughs> not that this is photography related at all. But no, but it is. I mean, so, really I mean, you know, we, you know, I, I, we were lucky enough to have an, a, an amazing publicist for California Love, and we got really great mentions in the Guardian and uh, among other among other places and i thought that it, it, that would lead to more instagram likes for me i mean not, not that i'm doing it for the likes but it really was like a minuscule only like maybe 10 i got like 10 likes out of being in the guardian which is like has wow. millions of of viewers so i, I it's, it's a mystery to me I, I it's more of a i'm sure I, i'm sure uh, other people listening are, are curious like how to get more likes organically yeah. but at the end of the day i want people to actually like my work and see my work and get your work out there i mean because you don't you don't create it for a vacuum we want people to see our work Right. It's like you know, we, we're proud of our children and we want our children to have great lives and, and, and get out there. So, yeah, this is a it's I'd be curious. I don't know, maybe if you find some some someone who's mastered it, I'd love to, to hear that episode. So the future episode <laughs> mastered what just using Instagram and social media or buying he, buying like just getting your work out there in general. I think that is something that people will ask me. I mean, I, I do the best that I can and really I'm focusing on just creating and just getting my stuff out there just because I love it and I want to share it with people that and not, not for the, you know, quote likes, you know, or whatever, not for the social media likes, but, um, but yeah, it, know, it just seems like it's a constant struggle of getting your work out there, you know, just having mm -hmm. people see it. Do you know of uh, a photographer named uh, Dan Milner out of uh, New Mexico? Yeah. Does he do blurb? I know him yes. from blurb, I think. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, same guy, same guy. Um, I interviewed him a while ago um, about because his thing is like he's like no social media. I don't mm. want to use social media at all. It's the worst for photography and like it, oh. it just ruins your brain. You know when it comes to thinking what is good, what's not good. Um, and he did this experiment where he will, you know, when he goes on a flight or whatever, he'll be sitting there at the airport and he'll be watching people on their phones and he'll know that they're on Instagram because of the the thumb scroll. You know the up ah. stop, up stop. Up, stop. And he'll yeah. watch them and he'll wait, you know, five, 10 minutes and then walk over to them and ask, uh, are you on Instagram? And they'll be like, yeah, I'm on Instagram right now. And he'll say, over the last 10 minutes that you've been on Instagram, what's been the most powerful photo that you've seen? And all of them will be like, oh, uh, uh, well, uh, and nobody will have an answer. Nobody yeah. Nobody will have an answer. So I don't know. I still struggle with that, trying to figure out, like, how do you get photos out there with that? Because I personally... I could do without social media. You know, I feel like part of it is kind of a necessary evil. Um, yeah. I hate it. And I would love to know more about, you know, how to get that out there. And I think, I mean, what I think is it, it's the way that you're doing it. You know, put it in front of people, put real things in front of people, let them really see it, put a book in their hand, you know, yeah, like, yeah, hold nice. a print in their hand. Cause that is going to be really impactful. And when you look at that, I can think of 40 photos in this book right now that I have, um, that I can think of off the top of my head that were really great photos. And the last time I went on Instagram, again, I can't think of a single photo that really meant anything to me. So I would say just stick with exactly what you're doing and because uh, that's the best answer that I got. <laughs> yeah, it's more of a conversation. I mean, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not worried about the likes, but, uh, yeah. but, it, but it is a mystery and it is, it is something that, that people obsess over. So, you know, yeah. and, and we all want to be liked. We all want to be loved. I mean, at the end of the day, sure. and, yeah. but yeah. Yeah, but but yeah, but it is kind of a facade, right? Well, if I uh, if I do get somebody on the podcast who has just absolutely mastered social media, <laughs> I will be sure to let you know for sure. But um, Michael, I think I feel like where we're going right now is is space for like ten more podcasts. So uh, I think that we're at the end of this one today. But before I let you go, can you let listeners know where they can uh, learn more about you, um, your work, and where they can find your book? Yeah, uh, the book is available. Uh, um, I would recommend going, if you go to my website, it links to one of my favorite bookstores, uh, Arcana Books of the Arts, and you can buy it directly from them. It's the same price everywhere. It's actually almost sold out. Um, it retails for $50. Um, you can get it directly through the Los Angeles Center of Photography for a little less if you find it on their website. Uh, but I, rec I really recommend trying to support independent bookstores, independent booksellers. They took a huge hit during COVID. And 
uh, you know, they're doing the God's work. And as a, an artist, again, that, that's one of your best opportunities to go out and look at a ton of work, go to a bookstore, you know, crack open a book. It's, it's not stuff that you're going to necessarily find on social media or, or on Instagram, like you just said. Um, so uh, yeah, uh, through my website, my name is a little tricky to spell, but if you, uh, I go by full on rad as in full on radical on Instagram and, you know, Facebook and, and I'm easy to find. Hopefully you'll have a, a link to my website as well. And you could read a lot of press about the books and you could find all my books there. And um, I guess if it's one last thing to say to inspire people is just grab your camera or your cell phone and just go out and do it and, and do that. And then also spend a lot of time photo editing. And if you want to curate, just find a space and put up some walls. And I'm sure you'll find a ton of photographers who, who will be very happy to have you exhibit their work for them. That is very cool. Michael, again, man, thank you so much for uh, coming on. I really look forward to uh, keeping up with you and, and seeing what you're doing here in the future. I appreciate it. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. I'm going to go ahead and cut the audio right there. Oh, you did it. That was wonderful, man. That was wonderful. Great. How do you feel? Yeah. Great. Yeah. It was kind of, it was pretty fun. Yeah. <laughs> it, it kind of went all over the place there, but uh, uh, I like, I like that sort of stuff. I mean, I like really, it. That's great. That's how to, conversations go. Yeah, I, I know. And I feel like sometimes I feel like I beat myself up because I really, I try to go in with, with an idea and have like a concise um, you know, a uh, series of questions to, again, as you said earlier, you, you have to kind of think about your audience and like try to deliver a, uh, uh, a set of information goals, you know, whatever it is so that they can go on in their photography and do the same thing. But sometimes I feel like you just got to understand that like a, a conversation is just going to go wherever it's going to go. And that was this, and I really enjoyed this. So thank you. Great. Great. Yeah. And hopefully other people will. <laughs> yeah. Well, that, do I care? You know what I mean? Like, well, yeah, should yeah. I care? I mean, you're doing it. 308 episodes. That's great. <sighs> yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, I got uh, two last questions for you before I let you go. Um, is there anything for whatever reason that you don't want in the interview? No, this is great. Okay. I'll listen to it again. And if something flags up, but yeah, no, I think like if, if I made a mistake, so your nominal memory is your memory of the naming of things. And, and mm -hmm. occasionally, like my, like I remember my grandmother would say something or when you're young, you catch older people doing this where they say the wrong thing comes out of their mouth, uh -huh. but you don't, you don't catch it in your brain. Right. So like in a past episode, like I've, I, I, I said the name of a store that my book was at. I said, instead of saying urban outfitters, I said American apparel, like not a big oh. deal, <laughs> but if there's something like that, where if I said the name, let me double check the pronunciation of Ryan Shooty. I, I think it's Shooty, not Shoot. Uh, but let me, let me make sure, let me double check that. Sure. sure. Uh, and it, and even if I got it wrong, it's no big deal. Maybe you could make a correction in there or something like that, or I could yeah. dub it over. Okay. Actually, let me just say it right now. Ryan Shooty, Ryan Shude. So now you have me saying it both Sorry, ways and then both. you could like cut it over. Um, yeah. I'm pretty sure it's Shooty, but I'll double check with him. Okay. Perfect. Perfect. He's great. Uh, he's super fun and would be a great interview. And his work is amazing. And he's yeah. such a hard worker and you've seen his work. Um, yes. I would go on his website. You could see a ton of, he's been doing it for years. He has okay. so much fun, whimsical stuff. I only have a few images in, you know, in the book, but in my book, but uh, yeah. It's, yeah. It's wonderful great. stuff. I would really appreciate the, uh, the introduction. That would be. Fantastic. I'll connect you right now. Yeah. I'll send Thank an email. You. Thank email. you. Um, and okay. One last, I'm sorry. Go yeah, on. go ahead. No, I say, I, but before we wrap, I'd love to see you when you come out to California. So hit me up. Um, if you're going to be in uh, Palm Springs or, or whatever, absolutely. I'm sure. You, yeah, for sure. If you're yeah, here for I would a month. love to, I'd love to do that. I'd love to get this book signed. <laughs> that would be wonderful. Great. This Great. is, uh, again, I mean, this book is really, uh, I feel like I really have a hard time uh, coming up with uh, the right words sometimes to use. But um, what I love is I love looking through lots of photos, you know, and when I look at, uh, say, a photo book from a photographer and you just get like their photos from this certain thing, sometimes I feel like uh, like some of it is being held back, right? Like a lot of their other work, because, again, you have to think of the audience, you have to think of the story yeah. that's being uh, told here. But there's such a diverse set of images in this book that every time you flip the page, it's like, oh, that's new. Like, oh, this is new. And oh, that's yeah. new. And it's very uh, compelling. Um, and I just love it. So again, thank you so much. I really do appreciate it. This is a great book. Beautiful, beautiful. Yeah, yeah I'm very proud of it. Yeah, you should be. Yeah, and it's, and it's going to sell out. We did 2,000 copies and it's I only have a couple hundred left and I'm not really pushing to sell it too much now because I have uh, future exhibits that I want to do and I want to tour it around California. 
And um, I have a publisher, knock on wood, I haven't heard back from him yet, but who mentioned interest, but, uh, but I would like to do a second printing with a, with a real publisher. This was done just independently through the Los Angeles Center of Photography. Mm -hmm. uh, and future, the book will always, profits will always go to the Los Angeles Center of Photography. It's an organization I believe in. But, um, but yeah, let, let, so yeah, hold on to it because it'll, uh, it'll be worth more. It's first, <laughs> the first edition. It's going to sell out. Uh, well, very cool. Thank you. Um, I got one last question here for you. And uh, well, I guess it's you already mentioned Ryan, but um, uh, do you know any other photographers who you think would make uh, or who would be a good fit for the podcast? God, so many. Um, there's a guy who shoots with a plastic Diana camera. His name is Daniel Grant. He's He was based out of San Francisco, but I think he just moved to Amsterdam and I can connect you with him. And he's great. He's super passionate. And he, he really has a great voice. And really it comes from that he just, he's very specific about using this one camera. Um, and I, I, Daniel Grant, uh, I'm following him on Instagram. So you could probably maybe find us that way or just Google him. I think okay. SF MoMA, MoMA has some of his work in their collection. Oh, really? Uh, really great guy, but just really, really great energy. And yeah, uh, he, he'd be good. He's in the book as well. I'm trying to, here, let me. Uh, I mean, that um, just goes to, uh, you know, what you said earlier about the camera, just, it really doesn't matter. <laughs> um, there's a guy who go, goes by Streetwise LA, uh, Kamal uh, Sillinger. I think it's like a Turkish last name, but he's based in Los Angeles. And he, he started, he got into it where he gave, uh, I think a borderline homeless guy gave him a video camera and so he was going around interviewing like people on Skid Row and then he would help him edit it. And then he, but he's always in the street documenting. Wow. Um, and his girlfriend does a lot of this collage work. So he's really interesting. Streetwise LA, I, I, would, I would check him out. Okay. Um, there's an artist who's great. She's kind of elusive. Uh, she's always working. Her name is Sylvia Grav, G-R-A-V. Mm -hmm. um, she's really mellow too. So I don't know, interview wise, she might be kind of... Um, uh, more soft-spoken, but check her, check out her work. G R A V Sylvia Grav. Okay. She's based, she's from Spain originally, but she, she lives in LA. I haven't talked to her in a few years. Um, uh, Hannah Kozak, K O Z A K. Oh yes. She has a book on that just came out around the time of this book um, on, on uh, uh, her mother who is, uh, has to do with like domestic abuse. And she's a documentary photographer. Her father survived like several concentration camps. And she has this amazing piece that's touring now to uh, about um about uh the holocaust and she's just very very passionate about photography she she's great she's great to interview wow i will definitely i will definitely uh, reach out to her as well uh there's a another woman nancy haraz h-a-r-a-s-z mm -hmm. who uh she's an illustrator or she's a designer and her work is, um, she's in the book as well. Her work is very, and it sells really well. And she has a very idiosyncratic style to her. She's someone who I could have mentioned as well in terms of like someone who has an, a, a style where you see yeah. her work and you know exactly who it is. Yeah, check out check out her work. And I'll give you one more. Um, he's an older guy. His name is Lonnie Shavelson. Uh, and and if you could get him, he's based in the Bay Area. He was a, he's a, he was a doctor who would work the night shift at an emergency room in the Bay Area in the 80s so he could Jeez. run around and photograph during the day. But he's also a journalist and now he helps people at, with end of life, like uh, end of life stuff, issues. So oh he's really God. busy with that. But if you could get him, he, he, check out his work. And he has several books. He has a book, uh, one of my favorite books is, is, uh, is called Personal Ads. And it's like, port, he would, Back in the 80s, people would post like personal ads of like a paragraph about yeah. themselves. So he would find them and do their portrait and then he would pair the portrait with the personal ad. So it's how his view of them compared versus with their versus them. Themselves. Incredible. It's an incredible book. And, and he did a thing on mental illness and he's very, very self conscious of like social issues and he's great. And if you go on his website, you can do, find like radio stuff that he did. He's part of like a journalist society. I have so much respect for this guy. Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely going to check him out. That I is... mean, I can give you more names too, but I think that that I don't want to over. <laughs> I don't know. I want to overwhelm you. Yeah, yeah, I said I just need to get through the summer, not uh, not through all of 2022. So I appreciate. It, that. But honestly, in the future, if you're looking, uh, hit me up again because I'm I, I'm I'm kind of a connector. Like I'm very good at connecting people, and it's kind of I naturally gravitate towards that. So I'm I'll, I can connect with. I can give you at least of like ten more people. I appreciate that. I, I really do. As I a really curator, do. you know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Happy that's to. one of those things that. Um, 
you know, as a as a podcast host, it's like one of the things that I love is being able to to speak with uh, many photographers and also try to connect them with with others as well. Like I mentioned, Dan Milner earlier, which, by the way, um, I was going to mention, um, which I don't have it. You know what? No, I'm not going to say anything just in case <laughs> I shouldn't. Uh, but he's got a book yeah. coming out soon, um, and he's he's doing really interesting stuff. So I didn't know if because uh, he also does the. Um, he had some compilation because can, you're talking about Dan. Yeah. Because Hannah Kozak, who I mentioned, is in his compilation that he has coming out, or maybe it came out already. It's of other photographers. Oh wow. That he does. Oh uh, yeah, uh, Shifter, Shifter Media, I believe it is. Anyway, yeah, yeah I'm not. I'm not I think she sent it to me. I think it's right here. Yeah, I should have. Yeah, uh, but anyways, should have prepared for that. But uh, anyway, no, I, I do appreciate it. Um, Michael, again, man. Um, this this was a fantastic conversation. I have to say thank you again so much for the book. I really do appreciate it. Um, before this interview comes out, um, if you have any questions for me whatsoever, you know how to get a hold of me. Um, and then I think I just need a headshot for. Oh yeah, which you you replied to that email. A headshot. I'm gonna send you. Yeah, yeah. I'll send. I'll yeah. I'll send that today. Yeah. I, I didn't know if we were gonna mention specific images, so I wanted to send you stuff kind of that would support what we talked about. So yeah, I'll send you. I'll I'll do that right now. Perfect. And then perfect. yeah, when you come out to California, man, we can hang out. We can geek out books. on photo books for, yeah. for a few hours, uh, drink some tequila. I'm, I'm, I, like I got it. some high in tequila. <laughs> if, I don't, unless you don't you drink, have, I don't want to. No, no. Yeah, that sounds great. You. Do you have a favorite uh, photo book that you're enjoying most right now? Uh, so many. Uh, it's really impossible. I have I have a stack of 12 right here that, I, that are, this is my to-do because my wife uses this table now for uh -huh. work. So I kind of don't have access to it. Okay. So then which uh -huh. one are you going to go through first on that stack of 12? Well, I was going to show you, uh, oh, dude, you got to check this guy out. I, I like the darker stuff. Uh -huh. This guy, uh, Myron Zauner, he's based out of Berlin. And in fact, um, Toshin is doing a big thing with him now. And Anthony Bourdain in his last season was in Berlin and, and interviewed this guy. Oh, wow. But put this guy on your list. Yeah. It's I dark mean, stuff, dude. It's like there's bodies in the street. Yeah, and just, I mean, that's, it's, it's, that's the cover. I can't imagine what's inside. It's He goes he goes dark, but it's, wow. it's really, really great. And um, uh so many. Um, oh, dude, this is one of my favorite books, which you should just buy. It's called the, the 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 Way of the Japanese Bath. It's by Mark Edward Harris, who you should also interview. Um, it has this beautiful dude. You got to come over and just. I'm gonna <laughs> you're gonna spend hours. I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you. Yeah, looking at it through a uh, through a Zoom camera is not uh, is not doing yeah. it, but it's uh, it's very exciting. <laughs> yeah, uh, that would be wonderful. So Do you know um, Scott Strazanti? I don't think I do. He is a um, he was a press photographer, shot for the uh, um, the Chicago Tribune for a number of years. Now shoots for the San Francisco Chronicle. But when he was living in Chicago, they sent him on some assignment to like cover this farm or whatever, this family who lived on this farm, and it's just a really old couple, no kids or anything. He just shot it, whatever. Um, kind of really enjoyed the couple. Would keep going back to them every six months to a year, and then eventually their farm was sold to a land developer who tore the whole thing down and turned it into just like a, a sub sub development, you know? Um, yeah. And then he documented that process. <laughs> and then a family who moved into a house where the, where the previous family, where their house stood and throughout all the years of capturing all of it, found a bunch of very similar photos of, you know, like the old man after a hard day's work laying on a bed. And then the new family, just like this kid who's just bored laying on a bed. Um, really interesting stuff. His book is called Common Ground. Um, I have your address. I'm going to send it to you because it is just so much fun to look at. It's so interesting. I have wow. his podcast. He was on like CBS Sunday mornings uh, a number of years ago talking about it. It's just really, really interesting stuff. But um, well, How yeah. do you spell his last name? Uh, let me pull it up for you. It is because it's a – I don't know if it's Italian, but it's a long one. Yeah. It is S T. R A Z Z A N T E. Yeah, it sounds Italian. Okay, great. Yeah. Yeah, I'll check it out. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, let's see. I love documentary projects that go over a long period of time. This casino yeah. book that I'm currently working on, um, 20, 30 years, I've been kind of documenting casino oh, wow. culture. I don't gamble. So I go to Vegas or I go with friends. They're gambling. I'm just running around with my camera, you know. So, so what is uh, it? Is it the people that that interest you? Is it the is it the lights? What is it? Yeah. So it's I basically contrast or I juxtapose uh, <laughs> um, the marketing of casino 
of where come out, you're gonna have the best time ever. You're gonna meet the love of your life. You're gonna make a ton of money. You're gonna have this great meal. And then yeah. I contrast that with the reality that I see when I'm there. Yeah. Uh, so that that's kind of that's kind of the the, the gist of it. Oh, but man, no no great. shortage of uh, vi- visually stimulating, uh, uh, um, interesting things to to document and capture. Of course. W- around casino culture, not just in the casinos, but around that culture, yeah. which I've been documenting for a while. And I'm pretty much done. I, I did. I went and did one last shoot because I want to get more fine art images. I have like a lot of documentary stuff but I want to kind of round it out with more things that would look good on a wall, you know? Mm-hmm. And when is that going to be out? working on that? Uh, well, I'm, I'm actually actively editing. I just was there two weeks ago um, doing, doing what I, might be the final shoot. Although I might go out with my brother in a couple of weeks to try to do more fine art stuff. Um, but I'm like, I have like a 230 page doc uh, kind of dummy or like, um, uh, maquette they call it like kind of ready to go because mm-hmm. I I have a template in InDesign that I use where I could drag stuff in and the editing process is is really important for me I mean it's to me it's as important as as, as documenting or as making the images you know sure. themselves so sequencing telling a story in a book pairing you know text with the images you know, I, I really spend a lot of time with that so um yeah so I've, I've been working on that for a while so it's very close but I want this to come out from a a European Distri- uh, publisher because it's kind of a it's a view that's kind of critical of american consumption and consumerism in a way mm-hmm. is there so a working kinda, title uh casino land tired of winning <laughs> i love that i i look forward to that i look forward to that i'm definitely gonna check that out that is yeah awesome. me too <laughs> yeah. um well michael again man uh, i appreciate all your time today um before i let you go here do you have any last questions for me we're good man and all the stuff we're doing now if, if you could if you want to cut this in uh if there's anything that's relevant or if it makes sense <laughs> okay. feel free i will thank you awesome all right michael well i'm gonna let you go um luckily we didn't have to take a bathroom break but uh <laughs> it's just about that time <laughs> sounds good so again man i will uh, i will talk to you soon and uh i'll keep up with you obviously through email for the headshot the photos and then uh coming out to la as well so again thank you absolutely yeah, yeah. really looking forward to meeting you in person man yeah you as well all right i'll talk to you soon talk to you soon man <laughs>